Maybe because we're running a little behind, we'll go to the next talk. And the next talk is by Craig Callender, and it's entitled Science, Philosophy, and Values. Thank you. OK. Hi, I'm Craig. I'm the uh, chair of the philosophy department. Um, these are supposed to be TED-style talks, uh, but TED speakers have six months or a year to prepare. I had two hours, so it won't be like a TED talk whatsoever. Um, this quote uh, from this uh, from the song by Tam Tom Lair, uh, you know, uh, is a great one for uh, the strategic planning initiative, which is trying to cross, uh, you know, find interdisciplinary possibilities between different departments. Uh, so, you know, it says, once the rockets are up, who, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. And it's also a good uh, quote for this particular uh, initiative uh, where um, Larry and um, John uh, uh, and I have been talking about uh, possible initiatives in uh, bioethics and other areas, related areas, uh, because obviously there's another thing that's not in his department is, you know, the ethical and so social ramifications of of what's being done. And so here I just wanted to uh, quickly sketch the basic core idea that, as I see it, uh, which is that you, know, you have all these rapid developments in, in technology and science, um, and, these, and they, you know, these often provide all these massive benefits to humanity, um, but they often outpace our you know, so, uh, social, moral, and legal uh, norms. Uh, uh, you know, we, we aren't equipped to deal with them as quickly as they arise. So we have all these challenges. And so there's this big gap between uh, what we're producing and our response to it. Um, the field of bioethics, broadly construed as environmental ethics, medical ethics, and other areas of ethics, uh, areas of philosophy of science and values. Um, it asks and answers these important questions. Even though there's no department of bioethics, there, there, um, there are still these important questions. And it really draws on interdisciplinary work. Um, you know, so you need to know the science. If you don't, need to know, if you don't know the science, you know, the, you know, you're not going to do very good bioethics. And you need to know uh, the ethics. You need to have some sort of, it can't just be whatever you think. It's got to be you know, some uh, reflected uh, uh, principles in that that, you're, that you come up with. Well, UCSD is, uh, as we know, is equipped with cutting edge science. Uh, so every single day when you look at, open your email, there's some sort of cutting edge thing uh, coming out in science. Um, and so we have all these world class scientists, but we also have all these world class uh, philosophers of science, ethicists, uh, and uh, political philosophers. And so what, the way I see it is this, we have this great untapped opportunity for you know, connection here. And you know, as we know, there's currently all these gaps on campus uh, between uh, the development of these new scientific ideas and, and, um, and uh, ethical ramifications. In fact, you can see two of the gaps. So here's, here's one, and then here's another. <laughs> you call one Gap Gilman and the other one Tory Pines. Uh, and so, you know, there's no, there are no, there aren't environmental ethicists. There aren't, you know, there's not a bioethics institute like at other places. Um, and so uh, I've already used up half of my time, and I'm on only slide one. Uh, so ethics, uh, you know, it, there is you know a 2,500 year old history of uh, a body of knowledge to draw on here, but it's not all just sort of sitting you know sitting around and if you're a philosopher, it's not all just sitting around in robes thinking about what is good. It's you know there's more to that. Uh, so you can find all these cases where philosophers are engaging science, and so. I have all these different examples, which I won't have time to get through. But if you think of things like any kind of cost-benefit analysis, you, you want to look at the, you know, the harms and benefits later. You want to monetize it in some way. And so if you think about climate change, as came out uh, big time with the, when the Stern Report was announced, uh, uh, you have to translate the later dollars, you know, future dollars, into present dollars. And so the uh, economists will introduce this discount rate R. And then uh, Stern you know, fa uh, famously put in essentially a zero discount rate. And so he said that the future harms and goods were the equivalent of today's harms and goods. Other economists, uh, mostly American ones, uh, like, uh, 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 said, no, 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 you need to put in like 3 4%, something like that. But then if you do that, you then quickly, you know, you're, you're making a, 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 a real judgment. You have to put in something, some value for R. Putting in zero is 
still putting in some number. You have to make that judgment. Where does that judgment come from? Where did, where the, where's, you know, it comes from some kind of ethical reflection in that. Um, you know, and, and it, you know, what's alarming in cases like this is that it really matters because, you know, this is a cost-benefit analysis for what a, a country is going to do regarding climate change. And you, you can quickly swamp the differences between all those different climate models by putting in different mo choices of R. You can get a party now or a party later result, uh, depending on what you like. Evidence-based medicine. Uh, so it's big. Everyone likes evidence. You want evidence. It's a, a truism that you know you want. Obviously, you, you, would you like your medicine you know based on evidence or not? Uh, well, you want it based on evidence. Uh, but of course, there was then evidence-based me medicine. Many agencies wanted work that was only evidence-based me medicine, meaning things like the gold standard of you know randomized control trials or the platinum standard of meta-analyses, and. But are those, are those uh, you know, philosophers of science trained in methodology and thinking about values and that can think about whether uh, in medicine or even outside of medicine in other areas, uh, whether you, know, you can tune a, ra a randomized control trial in various ways, uh, meta-analyses. There's a great uh, article where they gave all these experts in meta-analysis uh, to ask them to do meta-analyses on all these other meta-analyses and had massively discordant uh, results, and so what do you do then? You know, again, you need to, you know, you can't just fly by the seat of your pants. You should then, you know, be drawing on some, uh, you get some interesting theory, and there are interesting things to say. And so one, you know, an example is a book recently by my colleague Nancy Cartwright, who was sitting right there, you know, on evidence-based policy. Uh, you know, going more into medical ethics, uh, you know, you want consent. Well, from people, you know, uh, is, but what about people with cognitive deficits? What about something really hard and tricky like Alzheimer's, where people have all sorts of different dysfunctions and it's not so clear whether they have a uh, deficit at one time or another? You can come up with different diagnostics of dementia. Uh, should you say that a particular number score on that scale, mean, you know, if you score above, you're, you got consent. If you score below, you don't have to consent. It's very tricky issues, lots of problems. Many, many other issues, obviously, you know, beginning and end of life uh, questions, uh, surrogacy, genetic screening, genetic discrimination, environmental justice. Uh, uh, you know, as we saw recently in the, you know, uh, these cases, the uh, brain death, when, it, when are you dead? Uh, lots of, so lots of, tons of different issues. Um, and, it, and I think it matters. I think an argument could be made, uh, although maybe not by me, but uh, that, you know, at the end of the 20th century, you saw a lot of work in ethical theory, uh, in applied ethics, meta-ethics, all, all deep, these different areas of ethics, uh, emphasizing autonomy. And then in the hospital wards, you then start to see you know, informed consent forms and all of that. Probably there's back and forth flow of information there, but I think you know, these are cases where you could see where the, the highfalutin, you know, you know, it's not just Socrates with his robe and wondering what is good, but you know, where you can see it actually, you know, in, in influencing what's actually happening in a hospital ward. Finally, I'll just mention uh, two things. One is, uh, I'll just brag about my department, uh, and because our department's small and probably most people don't know what we do. Uh, you know, but we are uh, ranked in the top 20 in the world in ethics and political philosophy, and in the top 10 in the world in philosophy of science. We're already heavily invested in bioethics on campus, so we teach hundreds of students per year. Uh, in a variety of courses. We run a uh, ethics in the public sphere series, uh, public series. We're proposing a bioethics and pre-law minors. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things. Our faculty include, you know, two, two philosophers of science who are interested in values, uh, who have uh, our MacArthur Fellows, the Vault Chair, uh, all sorts of distinguished faculty. And what's important, too, is not just the moral stuff, but also the connection with the legal. UCSD has no law school. School. The nearest big, decent law school is USD's, and you know two of our faculty sit as directors of the Institute for Law and Philosophy. So we already have, and many others are connected there as well, and so we have all sorts of connections there. And so I'll just leave you then with an invitation to two of our events this quarter. Okay. We have time for one question. So, Craig, uh, the nearest USD is not really a great law school. It's a so-so law school. Uh, but the nearest great law school is USC or UCLA. 
Does that mean that we're going to be at a big competitive disadvantage in the field of bioethics because we don't really have a top law school in San Diego whatsoever? I brought some philosophers with me, so. Uh. <laughs> well, uh, when doing bioethics, we want to know answers. Sorry, when doing bioethics, we want to know the answers to certain fundamental questions about uh, values as they pertain to the sorts of cases that Craig was talking about. And we also want to know how, what, what policies we should adopt and the intersection of those policies and the law. And we do have um, uh, ethicists at the philosophy department who are well versed in law and uh, are able to address those issues. And they attend conferences in uh, both nearby and in other parts of the United States and the world where they discuss these issues. And in my, in my view, we're not at a disadvantage when it comes to the study and practice of bioethics, uh, given that we don't have a world class, I mean, we don't have a, a world class law school really nearby. We've got the world-class minds, but not the world-class law school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.